Good afternoon everyone. My name is Brett and this is Mark. We are representing the Wenjo International Christian Fellowship Leadership. And today, we've come out here today to give you guys some answers to frequently asked questions from our discipleship class teachings as well as the Sunday sermons. So we hope that today's answers could bring some light on some of the questions that you've been having. And we pray that it may find you in good speed. Thank you. Okay, so um, Mark will, will uh, say opening prayer for us and then we'll start with the questions. Uh, okay. um, Father, we thank you, we bless your name. Uh, as we've come to uh, study your word and you know, uh, seek you for answers to questions that have been bothering us, Father, we pray that you would give us uh, wisdom and revelation and insight into your word and uh, things that will bring understanding and illumination to our spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So, Mark, uh, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm well. Doing all right. good. Yeah. All right. That's great. I'm also very well. So, the first question, um, I'm going to read it. It says, I've heard about certain people who wake up to pray during the night or early in the morning at specific hours. For example, at 3 a.m. Because they believe that that's when God hears their praise the most. Is there really such a thing? Um... Well, uh, one thing that God always does it. God always honors faith. Okay, so God will always honor the faith of an individual who comes before Him. Uh, we read in the Bible most of the times Jesus went to the mountains early. You know, the Bible says like way before even dawn He would go up to pray. Uh, so it is, it is, it is a, an act of faith, but it is not necessarily that there is a specific time that. Uh, you pray God is going to hear you more than the other time. He's everywhere at every time, you know. He's uh, omnipresent, so God is everywhere at every time. So it's not as though maybe at 3 a.m. He hears you more than at 5 a.m. But the faith that you have before God in that moment is what He honors. The Bible actually says Paul was speaking to the churches and he said that uh, some people consider uh, one day more sacred than the other. Mm. So let's say they consider Saturday more sacred than the other days. And he says he goes on to say that one person considers all days alike so he said that the one who considers all day alike should not condemn the one who considers one day more sacred and the one who considers one day more sacred than the other days shouldn't also be condemned because both of them are doing it unto the lord so it's not as though they are doing something but they're doing it unto the lord so whatever time that you pray if you have faith uh in the pray in god and in the prayer that you are presenting to him god is gonna answer you he's gonna answer the prayer it's just that some people have built maybe a personal tradition you know to pray at this time or maybe uh, uh you know a way of praying maybe i sit down or i go on my knees and, and they believe that god hears in the way and what happens is that god honors the faith you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God because yeah. everyone who comes to Him must believe that He is and He exists. And He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So what happens is that the individual is seeking God and God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. But uh, uh, what exhibits your faith is the way that you are seeking Him. So in the person waking up at, let's say, 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. to go see God, you are exhibiting faith. And in that, God is well pleased. So He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. So, uh, Any time you go, as long as you have faith, but it's not wrong if you get up at a specific time to go pray and seek God. Okay, I hope that answers your question. That's great. And just to go on from this, um, do you suggest, you personally suggest uh, morning prayers maybe compared to times in, the, in other parts of the day? Do you, do, you, do you prefer morning prayers or would you suggest them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I think it's a very uh, <laughs> not here. I think it's a very important uh, thing. Jesus, we see it in the life of Jesus as well. The Bible says that he go performs miracles, and then in the, the next day they come to look for him in the morning. When they come, he's not there. He's gone to the mountains to pray. Yes. So uh, it was uh, uh, it was one of Jesus's tradition to wake up early to go seek the Father. Yes. What happened is that you set the pace for your day and what you were going to do. Jesus came down from the mountains every day and performed signs, wonders, and miracles, and did great things. And the people always wondered how he did it. And they marveled, but they never saw the time that he went to spend with the Father in the secret place. So it's very important. And, you know, practically, even when you wake up in the morning, your mind is not contaminated with everything. That is the best time to uh, 
you know, seek God. And it's also a discipline that uh, if you initiate into your life, it will be very beneficial to you. Uh, you, you it's, it's, it's also an exhibition of faith. Yeah. The fact that you have allocated the early part of your days, it's kind of like you're giving God a priority mm -hmm. in everything that you do. Mm -hmm. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and yes. all other things shall be added yeah. unto you. The emphasis is on the kingdom and it's also on first. Mm -hmm. first. Yes. So the kingdom is not secondary to anything. So even in your daily lives, you realize that when you wake up in the morning you even put the things of God first and what happens is that it is even a manifestation of your faith and then God is a rewarder of them who diligently seek you if if you you love someone in any way shape or form let's say a romantic relationship you cannot wait to spend time with the individual or you know you, you, you talk with a person or you know on phone or whatever it is you 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 love to be in the company of that person. And so it is with God. It's not as though God wants you to come into a religious act. Yes. It's like, if I don't come at this time, in the morning, you. yeah, he's not going to answer me or he's not He's not going to love me. But it's about the fact that I love God so much and I'm, I have so much intimacy with him that I just cannot wait to speak to with him in the morning. Exactly. Mm, yes. And the more you you've fellowship... You've consecrated that time. Exactly. You've consecrated that time. And yes. the more you fellowship with God, the more you become like him. Mm. See, the more I spend time with you, I begin to pick characters like you and yes. things like that. Yes. So the more you spend time with God in the early parts of your day, you pick on the nature of God, you fellowship with God, and it sets the pace for... Uh, the day and you know makes things really uh, good in the way that God intends for it to be. All right. All right. Thank you. So the next question is, what does it mean to walk in the spirit of someone? For example, walking in the spirit of Daniel. Yeah. And how can you walk in that spirit? Are there any practical ways to do that? Okay, walking in the spirit of Daniel. Uh, we read in the Bible. The Bible says that um, John the Baptist. Okay. So even the first, one of the first mentions was Elijah and Elisha. Yes. And he, Elijah, Elijah says to Elisha, uh, what do you want from me? Uh, El Elijah says, I want a double, a double portion, portion of, of your, your spirit. spirit. Not anointing, mm. not mantle. Mm. He said a double portion of, of your, your spirit. spirit. Okay. So what happens is that, now you realize when Elijah said, I want a double portion of your spirit, you have to understand that when Elijah was telling, Elisha was saying that to Elijah, he was already a prophet. The prophet had already come to anoint him. God says, go anoint uh, Jael as Jehu as king over Israel. Go anoint that as king over Judah. And then go anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. So he was anointed as prophet. But what happened is that when you say you're walking in the spirit of someone, it means you are walking uh, in, in, in uh, the character, first mm -hmm. of all, the character of that individual and the spirit by which that individual operated. Or it's kind of like there is a likeness, a similarity. Mm -hmm. So what Elijah was saying to Elijah is, I want to walk in a similarity to you anointing, but in a greater way. Amen. Because the, 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 the latter glory shall be, uh, shall be greater than the former. The former you understand? Yeah. And that is a biblical principle. Mm -hmm. So again, you see in the Bible, where the Bible says that uh, John the Baptist will come in the spirit of Elijah. Yes. Okay. So he'll come in the spirit of Elijah. So what happens is that he's... he's Elijah was so you see the similarities when you say someone is walking in the spirit of someone Elijah was in a time where the people of Israel were rebellious mm -hmm. that was when they had Ahab and Jezebel and they rebelled against the things of God so the, the people the of Israel of Baal. yeah exactly and the prophets of Baal so the people of Israel were living in rebellion at the time and Elijah was a prophet who confronted so he confronted the wrong that was going on he confronted Jezebel he confronted Ahab so it was kind of like he had this confrontation to, towards evil like mm -hmm. the prophets of Baal yes. and uh, uh, John the Baptist also came in a time where the people had rebelled against God mm -hmm. they had turned their backs against God that's why when they came to baptize you tell them that you brood of vipers yes. who have warned you to flee from the impending danger that is coming so it was a time where the people have rebelled against so it speaks about the similarities and the likeness of uh, maybe a ministry or an individual you're calling. So if I say uh, you're gonna walk in the spirit of uh, Isaiah, it means you're gonna do uh, walk in the way or minister in the way that Isaiah, Isaiah did ministered. as well. So if someone says that they are walking in the spirit of Daniel, what happened is that what God endowed Daniel with a spirit of wisdom, excellence, prophetic insight, uh, meaning that you are going to walk in a similar thing or in a similar way, manifest it. So it's kind of like there is a parallel between those two. You look at this and it, it's, 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 it looks as though that which you are going to walk in the spirit of is a preview of what you are going to do. Mm -hmm. So it paints the picture or it gives you a paradigm for what you're going to walk through. Because that is why it's very important to study the Bible because sometimes the things that God 
intends or desires to do through you. There is no picture for it. There is no paradigm for it. And it's very difficult to understand what God is doing if you don't have a paradigm for it. Yes. So you begin to question, why am I going through this? Why am I? Because you have no paradigm for what the things that you experience. No, you have no, no language for it. But when God paints a picture and says, okay, this is what you are going to be like, it brings understanding and clarity. Okay, so Joseph went through this in order to get to this place. Now I understand because I have something to compare it to. Yeah. Yes, that's great. And there was a there was a full up question to read. Yes. Like, is there a practical way to walk in the spirit of someone? Is there a practical way to walk in the spirit of someone? Well, first of all, before before you want to walk in the spirit of someone, you should walk in the spirit of Christ. <laughs> okay, that is the most important thing. Uh, sometimes we get caught up in it like in our day there's a whole lot of things going on with you know spiritual fathers and all of that and it's a very it's, it's a good thing there's nothing wrong with having a spiritual father but sometimes people place spiritual father in a sense over the spirit of Christ mm. and as the spirit of Christ who made your spiritual father who he is yes. the, Jesus said uh, Jesus could do nothing without the Holy Spirit so even if Jesus couldn't be Jesus without the Holy Spirit who are we to think that yeah exactly who are we to think that we can uh, do it without the Holy Spirit. So first of all, before you look to any man or you know desire to walk in the spirit of any man, manifest or operate like any man, there is nothing wrong with trying to manifest as long as you know what God has called you to do as well. But you must first be united with the Holy Spirit in fellowship, uh, in a time of fellowship, spending time with God, and then building yourself up uh, with God on a constant basis, so that you are not you are not misled, you are not uh, blown around to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Because it, what happens is that if you don't know what God says, if you don't know what God's word says, and you decide to go follow a man, or you don't know what the Spirit of God is saying, you go follow a man. If the man goes into error, you go with him as well. Okay, but if you know what God is saying, you are able to separate the meat from the bones. Mm. You're able to ch uh, chew the meat and spit out the bones. So first of all, before you look at any man as a picture, you first have to know the spirit of Christ. For example, if I want to look at the life of, uh, let's say, any man of God, let's say I want to walk in the like the spirit of Peter. God has said, I'm walking the. Peter made certain mistakes. Mm. You understand when he was eaten with the gentiles but when uh certain brothers came with it from the jewish people he abandoned the gentiles because he didn't want to be condemned and paul came around in galatians and paul said no peter you were a jew but you're acting like a gentile you're you are acting like a hypocrite so peter is a good guy and you can walk in the spirit of peter if that is what god desires but you have to know the spirit of christ so that you can able to sift out the wrong things that Peter did and walk according to the right things that so in order to walk in it you must also be a student of the Word of God that is what uh, the Word of God gives you language for what God has called you to it paints a picture of what you are going to do and what you are coming into yes. so it's very important that you study the Word of God and it gives you a paradigm or a picture for that you can re uh, relate to and walk out what God has called you to walk yes I think that was great when you said uh, when you were walking in the spirit of someone their life paints a picture and it becomes and it becomes a paradigm yeah yeah so you know exactly the things that you're going to face yeah, exactly and, and i think uh, it, the bible goes and says in ecclesiastes 1 9 that there is nothing new under the sun exactly uh, what has gone before what will, will, will happen again yeah. so i think as you say you should know the motive why why do you want to walk in this in the spirit of this person yeah yeah and then actually be a student of the bible so i think that that was really great and i hope that really answers your question the next and uh, just just the answer, but you should be sure that that is something that God wants you to. Mm. Sometimes we can look so much, try so much to be like someone when that is not what God has called us to be. Mm. God wants to birth something unique in you. Okay, Amen. so make sure that whatever if you want to, uh, there it's it's not bad to want to be like any man of God, but make sure that you don't lose yourself in trying to. In the process. Yeah, in the process of it, you don't lose what God has called you to do us or what God has deposited on the inside of you as an individual. Wow. Yeah, that's great. So the next question is uh, concerning relationships. <laughs> Amen. So we're getting into the juicy stuff. Um, okay, so is it a good idea to date or to marry someone with a different faith in Christ? Um, they're given an example here. They're saying, for example, a Methodist to marry a Roman Catholic, for example, if it is possible, wouldn't it have a negative impact on the children, number one? And number two, wouldn't they be confused about how to go in the faith in Christ since the doctrines are different in those churches? Wow, that's a good question. So, uh, first of all, 
second uh, second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Uh, it doesn't matter what denomination you belong to. Uh, now, when I say denomination, I don't mean, uh, for example, you take the Je Jehovah's Witness. It is not a Christian denomination. It is a cult. I didn't say a cult, but a cult. Now, a cult is uh, anybody or entity or organization which professes Christ, but is, uh, uh, doesn't, it professes Christ, but doesn't live according to the standards or the principles that Christ said. So, for example, the Je Jehovah's Witness don't believe that Jesus Christ uh, is God in the flesh. They believe that He is a God and so many other things. It is a cult. They profess Christ, but they ignore the truth of it, which even Paul stated that God appeared in the flesh. He was seen by angels yes. and all yes, of that. Of more than 500 people. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in Second Corinthians. So, uh, what happened is that if someone is a Methodist, uh, uh, a Catholic, now in some in some denominations there are certain practices that have been over the years and sometimes people ignorantly uh, practice that, uh, those things but it doesn't uh, make them non-Christians, okay? When you come to the realization of the truth, you accept truth and walk in. So you and I are not believers based on the denomination or abomination we belong to. We are believers because we believe in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That, that is the fundamental truth of it. So whether you are Baptist, you are Methodist, you are Pentecost, you are whatever church it is or Wendell Fellowship, yes. uh, the most important thing is that we believe in Christ Jesus. So it is not multiple faith, it is one faith. But then people sometimes have traditions in the church and they express the faith differently. You understand? So uh, it is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So regardless of the denomination you belong to, it is one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so th that is what you must first understand. Now, some of these churches, what happened is that, for example, if you go to the Methodist church, they, they sing a lot of hymns. Mm. That is not, there is nothing wrong with hymns. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Assemblies of God church, we don't sing hymns. But the one who sings hymns is not wrong. You understand? As long as you are walking according to the principles and paradigms of Christ, uh, there is nothing wrong with that. Now, ultimately, ultimately, you... Your, your Christian life shouldn't be based on the dictates of your denomination. Your Christian life should be based on the dictates of God's word and the leading of the spirit. Because what happens is that sometimes your church can say certain things which is called completely contrary to scripture. In a sense, you know, they say certain things but you look in the scripture yourself and you're like, well, I know the pastor is saying this but that is not what is in the scripture. Mm. You understand? So your, your, your Christian uh, life is not based on your faith. It's not predicated upon the denomination that you belong yes. to. It's based on your belief in Christ Jesus. And the so, word of God. And the word of God. So what you first have to understand that it is not multiple faith. It is just one faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. So again, it's not. it doesn't matter the denomination or abomination you belong to. It is just one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And if you say doctrinal differences, um, uh, what do you mean by doctrinal differences? It, some of those things are just uh, outward expressions which have no... Uh, eternal value so to speak mm. you understand that so yeah yeah uh, basically that that is it so it's not about maybe this denomination or that denomination and if you say uh, doctrinal differences the best doctrine is God's word mm. so first of all if both of them are given to if both denominations or both churches are given to uh, or are given opposing views about a particular thing let's say uh, two different churches. Brett is given one opinion about this thing and then I'm given another opinion. Well, let's go to uh, an iPhone shop. Let's ask Tim Cook mm. what is the real thing. So Brett might have his opinion, I may have my opinion, but ultimately Tim Cook has the final opinion, the final say in it because he's the creator of these things. So what happened is that if these two are given, definitely the truth is objective. Yes. You don't have multiple truths. Yes. Truth is objective. objective, so it's it's not it's not subjective it's not and it's, subjective. It's, it's, it's not relative. On your opinion, exactly. Yes. Truth is objective. So uh, when people are given opposing views about truth, then you first have to go into the Word of God. The Word of God will give you the ultimate truth. The Bible actually says it is the sure word of prophecy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Word of God will give you the ultimate truth, and you'll not be you know swayed to and fro by what uh, a lot of people say. So the very in, in terms of doctrinal differences, study the word of God for yourself so that you can have an upper hand in such situations. You know what is right and what is wrong. Uh, sometimes some churches have practices which are not necessarily sinful, but they are not necessary. So again, you learn how to chew the meat and spit out the bones. Yes. Yeah. Well, we
we should be like like the church mentioned in Acts 17 yeah, when yeah. Paul visited Berea. Yeah. As soon as he gave his uh, his exhortation, they went to search the scriptures to see what if he's saying is really true. Yeah. And that's something that we can adopt mm-hmm. to not listen to every single thing that comes comes out of anywhere. So we should keep the word of God as at the beginning of the the person said um, the person said that you know dating. That is it, you know, yes. dating someone. Dating someone from a dating or marrying someone mm-hmm. from a different faith. Yeah. Again, it is one faith. It's not multiple mm-hmm. faith. If you said different faith, let's say you, now you're talking about maybe Islam, Buddhism, Taoism, mm-hmm. Hinduism. You know, those are different faith. Yes. But in the Christian faith, it is one faith. Okay, yes. we may have different traditions, uh, but it is still one faith, one Lord. So others, maybe if you go to other church, you know, in show of their gratitude to God, they run around the church. So. In the old time Pentecostal churches, when you're praising God, they run around the buildings. Okay, if you come to charismatic churches, when you're praising God, they lift their hands, you know, in worship and all mm. of that. So, these are some of the things different that expressions different expressions, ex- mm. exactly. Mm. So they built a tradition around um, or a culture by which. So the, the culture that has been established is with, by uh, is upon that that uh, a denomination is predicated upon. So they have churches of different cultures, okay? And then they come up with these movements. So you have the holiness movement, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, and you know, all of that, the Protestant movement, the word of faith movement, you understand that? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I, I actually don't, um, Sometimes when I'm uh, looking at this, I just try try to look at it as though we are all one body, Christians, yes. rather than looking for what separates us. Mm-hmm. You understand yes. until we come to the unity of the faith so amen. it's really important yeah amen thank you so much so the next question is a very long one so please hang on for us um it reads is the bible really as authentic these days it has been translated into hundreds and thousands of languages which is beautiful because we are spreading the gospel as he said we should but i've just been doing a tiny bit of research and it seems as though there are a few things which are off if my memory serves me right, I remember we spoke about how if you translate the Bible into Greek or Hebrew, it goes very deep because there are way more characters or letters of the alphabet. Our descriptions are shallow compared to theirs. It's just like how when I speak in Shona, so I think we have already <laughs> got to the root of this. As a yes. word. <laughs> when I speak in Shona, the, the, when I translated the statement, it loses its feeling. A couple of them actually contradict each other like the King James Version and the New International Version. Like the NIV is technically missing 16 verses. What if the KGV, KJV is missing 100? Remember how people were never allowed to read the original Bible or Torah because it was for those seemed worthy. If they were biased, they would say that whatever works for them and their agenda. What if the people who discovered all of this and translated it did it systematically? Just like how most of our history, okay, <laughs> most of our history as black people is systematically covered up and discredited by reliable experts so that we only know what they want us to know and confirm to, conform to. Why are those books like the book of Enoch randomly left out? Do you think this is we, do you think this is why we have to rely heavily on the Holy Spirit for revelation of his word? Thank you. So we well, as black people. Yes, we as black people. Uh, as Africans. Yes. Okay, Th- that's good enough. Uh, who who has that question? Please. Who? Michelle. Michelle. Uh, Michelle. <laughs> that's a very deep that's question. Powerful. So, uh, first of all, about the different translations of God's word. Now, let me explain something to you. First of all, now I will explain other things. First of all, it has to do with one of the issues is language. Okay, language is evolving. Okay. But the idea remains the same. Mm. You understand? So, for example, one translation will say, how art thou? In, t- in 21st century, I don't come and say, how art thou? It, it wouldn't be someone, maybe you are in the church culture, so you would understand what, how art thou means, or what it means, or how it relates to you. But someone will say, what are you even talking about? Mm. That is 18th century English, okay? Mm. So King James will say, how art thou? Mm. And then it, maybe New King James will now say, how are you? Mm. In a way that because language is evolving mm. now 
if you look at the Bible, there are so many translations of the Bible. You have the King James, they have the Young's Literal Translation, you have the Message Bible, the Amplified Bible, the NIV, uh, you know, and all of that. And by the way, the NIV is one of the most accurate translations of the Bible, uh, just, just to put it out there. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what happens is that, for, for example, so, uh, in, uh, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Greek. The Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, what happened is that they've been translated into so many languages. Uh, in uh, you know, it was also written. Some of it were written Ara Aramaic. Uh, so we have Latin, we have English, we have French, or whatever it is that's written in. Now, some translations, for example, the Young's Literal Translation translates the Bible literally. Okay. So now there are two words that you can translate it, and I'm, I'm going to explain the two words you can translate it. The Young's Literal Translation, for example, translated literally. So, uh, for example, in China, right, when you want to say hello to someone, you say Ni Hao. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, if you translate uh, Ni Hao into English, it means you, you good. good. You good. You good. You understand. Yes. So Ni Hao means you, you good. good. You understand. So Young's Literal Translation, or even the ESV does it a lot as well. Yes. What they are, they are giving you the literal translation. And you get it. So instead of saying, but in today, uh, but when you are saying it in English, even though it is tr literal translation is you good. If you were saying it, you wouldn't say to me, it means you good. You say that, how are you? Yes. Okay. So the, 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 the literal translation is you good, but the, the, the idea or the meaning of you good is how are you? Okay. So the translation such as Young's literal translation translated, you good, and it's not wrong. It is the literal translation for you to understand what it was literally written in. Mm -hmm. And then a Bible such as uh, uh, the ASV, American Standard Version, will say, how are you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so someone will say, ni hao means you good, and you're right. And another person will also say, how are you? And how are you has much more words, different words. Yes. But what happens is that even though it's you good and how are you, the idea is still the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the, it, it's not about the words, it's about the fact that the idea is maintained in the scripture. You understand? It's about the fact that the idea, so you can use different even words as language evolves, you can use different words to convey the same ideology. Okay, that is why we have so many different translations of uh, uh, the scriptures. Uh, it's, some of them are literal. For example, if you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the King James says that now concerning spiritual gifts. Mm. And if you look in the King James, the word gifts is in italics because it wasn't in the original context, in the original Greek writings. But then if you look at a book such as, uh, a, a, a version such as um, Young's literal translation to say, now concerning the spiritual or now concerning spiritual things, it didn't bring gifts there. But what happened is that the spiritual realm is a whole dimension of its own. You know, the whole the spiritual realm is a whole dimension. And there are so many things which constitute the spiritual realm. And one of the things which constitute the spiritual realm is gifts. Okay, so what happened is that now in, in the literal translation he says now concerning spiritual things, but in the spiritual things I'm talking about gifts in the spiritual things. Mm -hmm. So it's not even wrong for me to also say now concerning spiritual gifts, yes. although that is not the literal translation, that is the idea, idea that is being projected. So it hasn't lost anything, nothing has been lost in translation. So you see, so uh, it's even a blessing that we are able to have so many translations of the Bible as time is evolving. You, you understand? You're able to get much more uh, accurate meaning as to uh, what something is saying. They are not lost. For example, right, today, so let's say that um, maybe this, this painting, right, uh, the person who, who kept this painting there, if we are talking about the person, we can say that the guy who kept this thing here, he nailed it. Now, he nailed it could mean two different things. It could mean that he nailed he it to the wall, the wall or he did a very good really, job. Yes. Okay, so let's say that we are meaning he nailed it. So if we just write it, he nailed it there, 2,000 years later, maybe he nailed it, meaning he did a very good job, wouldn't be uh, a catchphrase or wouldn't be prevalent. So they will interpret it as, oh, he nailed it to the wall. And that is not what we meant. We meant he did a good job. So in the same way, when someone says he nailed it, it can also be translated, he did a good job. So he nailed it and he did a good job. Different translation, but the same ideology. It carries the same message. Same message. So someone say, well, why is this translation saying he nailed it and this one saying he did a good job? Why different words? It's not about the words, it's about the ideologies or the understanding that is being projected out of it. And then both of them can carry the same thing. I, I, I hope you get it on, on that part. Yeah. And uh, uh, speaking, speaking, and also, uh, what, what were some of the things that were addressed? I remember how people were never allowed to read 
and you know going back in our primitive times uh, at that time it's not the same thing but at that time the Roman Catholic Church was like it was more than a religious organization it was a political organization as well they had more influence than the kings as well you know so uh, some, there were some corrupt leaders in the, in the, ch the Roman Catholic Church at the, at the time as well and what they wanted to do was manipulate people for money you know so they'll prevent people from uh, uh, you know studying the scriptures for themselves and then they take you so for example if you wanted the forgiveness of sins you have to pay an amount of money and this is church history it's real you know you have to pay an amount of money to the priest before you do your confession uh, and then that was when uh, this guy was his name Martin Luther so I was like no you know forgiveness of sin is by justification you know you have faith in Christ and justification and that was when he nailed the 99 thesis to the wall you know in Germany uh, so uh, what happened is that and now we're 500 years later and 500 years later yes. we are living in the freedom of it you understand so uh, what happens is that sometimes people have a trans a problem with the word of God saying you know but it was written by human beings mm. you understand how can we say it's of God and 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 the Bible actually said that no scripture or word of prophecy came out of human origin but the holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God you understand so the scripture even though it is written by men it is under the inspiration of God the Bible says in Job that there is a spirit in man and it is the inspiration of the Almighty that give it understanding so the Spirit of God inspired holy men and gave them understanding to write about things now I think here is where a lot of people have problems with the word the, the Bible as a book to speak first of all people some people say that well uh, can we get any evidence of the validity of Jesus Christ outside the Bible and I say first of all that question is wrong in itself mm. because the Bible is not one book which proves the validity of Christ it's multiple books Combined. which all give validity of Christ which yes. have been put together yes. so it's not as though the Bible is just one book which is validating Christ it's Mike there is Matthew there is Mark there is Luke there is John mm. there is Acts there is Romans and some of these guys didn't even know each other and they were all validating Christ and their books have been kept together so there are multiple sources which validate who Christ mm. Jesus is and also to uh, if you go to Greek history, the guy has a Jesus Christ has a Wikipedia page for crying out loud. Now yeah. it is a cliche, but what I mean by that is, he's if you put the spiritual his divine nature aside, there was a guy who existed two thousand years ago by the name of Jesus, okay, who was called the Christ, and he he was executed by uh, uh, crucifixion. Th that is a fact. It is uh, known by Greek historians, by Hebrew historians, yes. uh, by Roman historians. The only people who deny it is are the Islam, the Muslim people, who believe that you know God changed someone's face to be like Christ, and the person died in place of Christ, which is completely bogus. Yes. It, it it goes against the grain of every fact that is available. Mm -hmm. Even heathen uh, facts prove that Jesus Christ, a man, existed and died by crucifixion, and they never found his body as well. Mm -hmm. So now the problem that people have is that. The problem people have is about the, um, the you know, but still it is men who wrote it. Now, this, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, the, the Bible, and I'm going to explain it, the Bible is completely human. And also it is completely divine. But just because there is a human nature to the scripture doesn't discredit or uh, its validity. In the same, you know what else is completely human and completely divine? Jesus. Jesus is completely human. The Word made flesh. The Word made flesh. So Jesus is completely human and completely divine. But his humanity doesn't uh, devalue, or, or his humanity doesn't devalue or do away with his divinity. He was called the Theoanthropos. Theo meaning, that is Greek. Theo means God. Anthropos means man. Theo, God. That is where we get some word like theology. Theology. Okay, uh, uh, so Theo means God, Anthropos means man. He is God man. He was tired, he slept as a man. But it didn't take away his God nature. So it is human in the sense that it was written by human beings. Okay, uh, but it, they were inspired by God to write these things. And the word, the word of God is true. So just because human beings wrote, it doesn't mean it's wrong. They were inspired by God. That is why even though, for example, you go into the Old Testament, the book of Deuteronomy, it was written by a man, Moses. It was written by under the inspiration of God to the point that even Jesus Christ quoted it when he was tempted in Matthew chapter 4. He yeah. said, it is written. Mm -hmm. 
he wasn't just quoting the man he was quoting something that god had said or inspired the man to write through his servant yeah through his servant moses yes you understand so uh the, of course human beings wrote it and uh but it doesn't dis dis uh, devalue it or discredit it is even the grace of god which has allowed us to have so many translations to bring about understanding of what the word of god is saying imagine if we were to read the bible in first century uh well i don't know there, there wasn't english in the first <laughs> century but, but you know in the earliest uh english you wouldn't understand the thing it's, look at some of the when people some of the scottish people speak english you do, you're like what the heck is going on you can't understand you can't even them understand now. them now <laughs> so. even how, how many times do you understand the king james bible mm. you understand so it's a blessing to you the reason why you are able to even make these questions is because you've read other translations which have given you understanding mm. you understand that not a lot of people understand the king james uh version so the translation is to bring about uh 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 understanding uh, understanding to us the translations and it's, it's uh, a very good thing now the saying that the niv has lost uh 16 translations that is not true uh for example now that is why the word of god says we should study to show ourselves approved unto god okay so for example if you read uh in the king james version you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Like, you know, come thou with us, as is, forgive us, as is, forgive us, as forgive those who trust by no interpretation, but leave us for evil. And it goes on to say, For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, watch this. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It's not in the original manuscript. Okay. And it was never intended to be. So, what happens is that if you read in the Bible, Paul tells people, You read this letter, pass it on to this church. You read this letter, pass it on to this church. So what happened is, it is their manuscript, it is theirs, and they have written certain things alongside it. Mm -hmm. it's, for example, if I have my Bible, okay, that is why if you read the NIV, for example, it ends up, and not even the NIV, some Bible, they don't add for thine, the kingdom. Our Father who you know, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom, can I read that? As we forgive those who trespass, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, and they end there. But the King James goes for thine. So if it's my Bible, I can write a commentary something that i understand so the king james version of the bible would make it clear to you that this is just like the amplified bible when it puts in parentheses some of the things it says in there it is not exactly what the, the scripture is saying but they are giving you a picture or an idea of what some of these things would mean and they let you know this is not really written there but this is giving you a context or it's a way to expound on, yes, on it on but it's not word. written there so that's what so if you read the bible you must know the history of the bible you're reading and understand what the bible is trying to tell you so the niv doesn't even omit any so that is why sometimes when you read the niv instead of some verses being in the scripture they write it at the base of it it's at the footnote at the footnote yes, so it there. lets you know that in the original text it's in not the there. original manuscript wasn't there it wasn't there yes. but in the subsequent manuscript because people had made notes in they had made it part of it there so i'm gonna bring it for you to know that okay this is what is was what was added but it's not in the original text but okay. you can still read it there. you understand so one thing that the king james so for example the esv tries to get the literal meaning of the bible and the asv tries to get the idea of the bible but the niv does both mm. it tries to get the literal meaning and then the the uh idea together and give you understanding mm. that is why the niv bible is one of the best you can regardless of what people are saying about it they don't know what you're talking about mm. okay yeah. yeah and another thing is uh whatever bible you are using if you were to accept christ yeah. today and you were to read this Bible, I believe God and the Holy Spirit will still speak through you too, through that exactly. scripture. Exactly. And you, you, you cannot, you, you, what do you have to say about that now? Exactly. So. It, it, you cannot, when you study in the scripture, you cannot leave the Holy Spirit out of it. Yes. And that's what sometimes people try to study the Bible as just a book and taking away its divinity. Mm. But you must bring the Spirit of God into it to bring illumination and understanding. Mm. So the Spirit of God brings, you know, in the early church, right? First of all, it's not the Father, Son, and Holy Bible. It's Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. The early church, we are blessed to have these scriptures in the New Testament. The early church didn't have the New Testament scriptures. Mm -hmm. How were they doing it? By the Holy Spirit. Mm. So ultimately, if you bring the Holy Spirit in. Now, let me, let me give you this testimony. Before, before I, I have read the New Testament so many times, right? Over and over again, since I think 2010 or 2011. I've been reading it over countless times. Now, before that, when I first started reading, I was reading one time, and you know, I was now starting, and it says that he, Jesus was being tempted, and he said, man shall not live by bread alone. 
So I paused to uh, uh, assimilate it. to assimilate it and to let it sink into my spirit. And that was how I used to study it. I you know pause a bit, and before like I could continue reading, I was like, well, if man doesn't live by bread alone, what does he what live does by? He do? And I was meditating on it, and the understanding I got was. Then, if he doesn't live by that alone, I processed it for a while, and the understanding that came was that then he lives by the word of God as well. Mm. And then I went and read the scripture, and it says, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but every, by every the word, word that, that proceeds out of the mouth of God." Mother. So I got inspiration or understanding from the Holy Spirit that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by, before I even before saw it, even saw, saw it in the Bible. So it's the Holy Spirit. So at the end of the day, when you study it, if you have that desire to go before God, to study the scripture, the Holy Spirit will bring illumination and understanding. Amen. You understand? So keep the Holy Spirit in it, okay? Amen. Yeah. And just the last part of the question was, why are these books like the book of Enoch randomly oh, left out? Okay. Yeah. And we're going to the last question. Okay. Why are these books like the book of Enoch, uh, the book of Edith, I believe, uh, uh, what are some Judith, of the books? Judith, Judith, Judith Tobit, Tobit, and all of that. Ecclesiasticus. Yeah. So now, people believe that, you know, uh, there were a group of people who came together and selected certain books of the Bible and then uh, decided to make those canon and then throw the others away. That is absolutely not true. And that is something I'll be teaching in discipleship class after we are done with the gifts of the Spirit. I hope you guys are enjoying it, by the way. Yes. And you see the way you guys are already flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Like, yes, it was it amazing. Was I, 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 uh, uh, Alina had a word of knowledge <laughs> when Shadow was sitting there. Oh. And, uh, you know, she saw a laptop. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. You, you were there, right? Yes. You were there. And under normal circumstances, you'd be like, this doesn't make any sense. But she was praying about a laptop that very day. Yes. You know, She says, when she first bought a laptop, yeah. she told she, she told God, okay, three years, I want to change it to three yeah, years. Exactly. This is the third yeah, year. This is the third year. Yeah. And she was talking about it today. today. And she was praying for a word of, for God to speak to her about it. And she saw a laptop. It doesn't make any sense. But she stepped out in faith. Mm. And it's in faith that you achieved. So now her faith has been built up. Next time, she will take it to another level. That's true. And that is how you grow in it. By the way, what was I talking about? <laughs> You're talking about Enoch. In, Enoch. In, 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 so in, in, those kind of books. So uh, the subject class, we are going to go into that uh, very soon. Uh, but the, the idea is that, you know, certain people came together, selected which books would be part of scripture and which wouldn't be, which is not true. Uh, uh, there was something known as the Council of Nasi, okay, the Council of Nasi, and that is what these people believe that they came and kept the scriptures together and threw the others away. That is not true. What happened was, again, with the reference that I made, uh, what uh, Paul would do and say that, give this, after you have read these letters, give it to the next church and take the letter from them. And then they would also read. That was actually how the canon came. So the books that had validity, because certain people had written books which were not valid. So the books that were had validity and they knew, okay, this was from Paul, this was from Peter, this was from James, this was from John. They started, it started circulating among themselves. And those rose to the surface and the others stayed behind. Yes. Okay, so the 66 books that we see, it's not the Council of Nazi who brought it. Those were the 66 books that were circulating among the churches at that time. Because, yeah, exactly. Because it was valid. See, God in his divine wisdom knows how to get things down. And sometimes, the reason why people find it hard to understand is they, they don't have natural selection. <laughs> that is some of the idea. The reason why people find it hard, natural selection, people find it hard to understand is because they feel like if God is going to do it, he doesn't have to use a man. But God always uses a man. Even when God had to come save humanity, he had to use the form of a man. Okay, so what, what happens is that uh, these were the books, these all read it, and these were those circulating among them, so the other books had drowned. So it's not that the, so what the Council of Nazis said, in order to avoid any confusion, uh, let us take the books which are, see God used these men, and they came together, and the books which were already prevalent in the church, or they just took those books and put them together, and then also brought understanding of what it means, and, and clarification of scripture, and that is how we go on. So those books, the Spirit of God did not lead it to be included, because even the early church, the people like Paul and the, weren't using them. Okay, uh, so God has given us what we need. Even the Bible that we already have, there is so much revelation that we've not tapped into it yet. Yes. There is more. I always say all the time, like one verse of scripture, like John 3.16, is, is bigger than the whole Bible. You can study for 20 years and every time you get a fresh revelation out of it. That's true. So what happens is that this word of God is compressed. It's like a compressed file. When you open it, so much revelation jumps out of you. And that's why you can read one Bible verse in one season and it will be such a tremendous blessing to you. And then you'll be going through another thing and you read the same verse and it will still speak to you again because that's how rich it is. So even this one, you cannot even be done with it. Those were the books that God didn't... 
some of it were actually written, uh, inspired by God. But God says, it's not for this generation. You don't have to use it. So it is out of the picture. And when you try to take what God has put aside, you begin to go into errors. There is a reason why God didn't allow that. Okay, God didn't allow you to be incorporated because it was it's not necessary to your salvation and your growth in Christ. God has given you everything that you need. The Bible says He has given us everything which pertained unto salvation. So everything you need to grow as a believer, God has given it to you in this word of God. Amen. So powerful. Thank you. Um, we we come to the last question, mm -hmm. and it says, "How can one make it sink in that they're using their gift to glorify God?" And that they should not make it about themselves. Mm -hmm. well, how can one make sure that uh, they're using their gift to glorify God and not themselves? Yes. Uh, th the fact that you're even asking this question shows that, you, first of all, your heart is right. Yes. The fact that you are concerned about making sure that your gift, and that is a, a lot of problems, that is some of the problems that a lot of Christians go through. You know, uh, there, there, there is a temptation to go into performance. You know, and that is why sometimes we see a, a whole lot of Christian Christians today, and even preachers trying to be maybe the next T.D. Jakes or the next uh, uh, Bishop Noel Jones or the next uh, Benny Hinn. Or, and there is nothing wrong with trying to be like these men. As a matter of fact, you can even walk in the spirit of your father, and there will be so much similarities in it. You, you understand that? Um, uh, so there is there is nothing wrong with walking in in it, but. The fact that you are concerned about it shows that your heart is right with God. Okay, you are not trying to see because when people go into performance, okay, Ben Hinn is doing this and getting results. Okay, so let me do what he's doing, and it's not led by the Spirit. It's performance. Let me perform what Ben Hinn is doing so that I get a result. Mm. And it's not that. It's about the Spirit. Yeah. Just be real. Just be you. You understand? Don't try to be like anyone. Just flow the way that God has ordained you to flow. We've been studying about our prophets in the gifts of the Spirit, and we've learned that there are even different types of prophets. Yes. Imagine if a Nabi prophet is trying to operate. I told you about the story of Belhamon, who said he wanted to see like and then he saw nothing. Mm. You understand? If he forces all the way, he can even be influenced by a demonic spirit now. You are stepping into a territory that God hasn't Doesn't designed you. for you to. Yes. So, first of all, again, the fact that you are concerned about the shoes that your heart is right with God, and try not to get into a performance mode. Forget about trying to please people. So the, the first step to making sure that you walk in your gift and glorify God and not yourself is to die to yourself. You understand? You have to die to yourself. And for some people, it's just like that. They die to themselves. Others, it takes a process. Um, yeah, yeah. So you have, to, you have to die to yourself, pick up your cross. And, and, f and follow right. So it shouldn't be about you anymore. So every time you make Christ the focus of what you are doing, you make God the focus of what you are doing, you make Yahweh the focus of what you are doing. And when you do that, what happens is that you, you, you fade away, you fade out of the picture. You understand? And when you stand there, and, and, and s sometimes people do it to feel accepted. Okay? But it, you are not doing this to please people. Paul, Paul actually says, if we were still trying to please men, we wouldn't be servants of Christ. You understand? Jesus, Jesus who preached so powerfully, and even as he preached, the Bible said that he wouldn't entrust himself to men. People were trying to praise him because of yes. what he did. And just it's like, he didn't entrust himself to men because he knew what was in every man. Yes. So don't, don't do things to seek the approval of people. Now, watch this. Just because you are tempted to do things for your glory doesn't mean you've sinned. It is succumbing to the temptation that makes you sin. So just because there is a temptation doesn't mean you've sinned. Jesus was tempted to, to turn the stone to bread. That doesn't mean he sinned. When the temptation came, he resisted the temptation. So being tempted to glorify yourself is not a sin. But when you don't resist it and succumb to it, that is when it becomes a sin. So as a young individual, maybe you can sing, you can prophesy, you will preach in the gifts of the Spirit, uh, you can play an instrument, you, can, you have oratory skills, whatever your gift is, uh, sometimes there will be a temptation to become the forefront of it. But take uh, you know, a step backwards and identify, this is not about me, it's about God. And God, let your name be glorified. Only because the Bible also says He is a jealous God. Yes. And He shares His glory with nobody. So you're getting into a wrong place if you begin to take God's glory. He doesn't like it. He's not cool with that. Okay. So you make sure that you are not taking God's glory. And whatever you do, you're doing it as to glorify. The temptation may come, but resist it. Okay. It is not. It is. You don't want to accept it. And when you glorify God, He will glorify you. All right.
Yeah. Yes. And um, we should fan, fan into flame the gracious gift of God that yeah. He's given to us. Yeah. I think we learned in the previous discipleship class um, about actually developing our gift, yeah. you know, and getting real understanding from the Word of God of the things that God has deposited into us. And so I think we've reached the end of the questions and answers for today. Do you have anything else to say? Um, no. Uh, did you, did you have any other question or something? None? Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we, are, we are done. Uh, we just wanted to, you know, we aren't always able to answer all of these questions. And what we decided to do was uh, answer some of these questions this way and then put it on the church uh, YouTube page and then... It's kind of like the light just got brighter. Yes. The church YouTube uh, page and uh, Facebook page as well, so that you guys can access it whenever you want. And you know, uh, we are not able to do it. So if you have any questions, you can send it to Titch or myself anytime, and then we will accumulate them and try to answer your questions, whatever it may be, as long as it's related to uh, the faith. Uh, we will be we will answer your questions and. Uh, you could, and also when we do this, you know, even after if we post it on the church's uh, YouTube and Facebook page, even long after we are gone, uh, people who come later on it can still be a blessing to them. Okay, uh, so understand that you are you are part of something which is bigger than yourself, and just try to uh, yeah be a blessing yes. by asking questions as well in any way, shape, or form. Okay, uh, so God bless you. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank God you. Bless thank, you. Thank you thank for you your so thank much. you for your questions. And uh, when we get the next set of questions, we will um, try to answer them. And even when you go home on the holidays, you travel out to another country, you can still uh, f uh, you know have access to these things just to build your spirit. And uh, 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 Peter actually says that um, you know you should know how to make a defense for the faith. That is where we get the word apologetics from. Yes. Uh, the defense of the faith. Yeah, First Peter 3.15, mm -hmm. make a defense. So that's why we answer some of these questions. It gives you a spiritual stamina and a spiritual spine where you're able to defend your faith in this world where there's full of uh, uh, doubts Perverse, and yeah. perversion and all of these things. And you can accurately defend your faith and you know bring people to the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. Okay? Amen. So, yeah. And so, uh, Father, we just thank you for this wonderful moment and uh, for your spirit inspiring us and the understanding you've given unto us and father we pray that this word will quicken our spirit and lead us into greater depths in you and higher heights into you, in you uh, in the name of Jesus we thank you and bless your holy name amen I'm excited about your future <laughs> thank you